Okay, let's get started. Hope everyone had a good weekend. So um, this, this week, uh, we're going to do all stuff about server security. Um, we talked a little bit about SQL, in, actually, we talked a lot about SQL injection um, before. And, uh, and we also talked a little bit about uh, how to handle uh, users who are maybe uh, hitting your site too frequently and trying to log in too many times and how to deal with rate limiting and captchas and stuff like that. Um, and so today is going to be sort of an extension of that, just more kinds of ways you can mess up on the server, different kinds of attacks, and things you can do to defend against um, attackers. And uh, mostly focused on uh, safe coding practices. So things that, uh, things that you might be doing uh, wrong that will encourage sort of security issues that, you know, to come up. Uh, or um, stuff like that, basically. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. So first, some admin. So um, there's going to be a hands-on workshop with Pete Snyder uh, from Brave, who's our first guest lecturer, if you remember. And the uh, Stanford Applied S uh, Cybersecurity Club is going to be hosting that. Uh, and that's going to be, I guess, Thursday at 6 to 7 in Gates 174. And dinner's served, right? Yeah. Uh, also, we have some new students in class today. In the very back, uh, the two people in the very back are some new students. Uh, my parents, <laughs> they're here, they were in town, they're here to watch, uh, watch me lecture. So be nice to them. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so I also wanted to mention um, there have been three students so far who have found security issues and reported them, and so they've, they've received extra credit. I just wanted to call out a couple of them that were kind of interesting. Uh, there was an XSS found in uh, Access, and uh, since Access is part of the Stanford Bug Bounty Program, um, this student, I don't know if I want to say who it was, you can volunteer your, your own name if you want to, but anyway, was, um, was able to report the bug to the Bug Bounty Program and was given $100 uh, for that from Stanford, which is pretty cool. And another uh, student found an XSS in a CS course website uh, and actually led to potentially being able to change assignment scores, um, which is uh, not, definitely not good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, s someone else found um, an insecure design that allowed uh, the test cases in a coding challenge for a job interview to be revealed. So you could sort of see the test cases they were going to test your code against. Um, the, the latter ones didn't receive any kind of a bug bounty reward because they weren't sort of covered by, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, or aware, the CS course sites aren't covered by the bug bounty program. But um, um, maybe the coding challenge one will get, uh, get a reward. But yeah, just a reminder about this. You have a couple weeks left if you're interested. Um, it's completely optional, but um, it's kind of fun. So uh, remember, you, you can do this if you want. Cool. So, uh, so first, let's start with a story. <laughs> so one weird trick to make 25K, uh, security teams hate him. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a story a couple weeks ago on, on all, all the tech news sites uh, that's super relevant for the, the stuff we're going to be talking about today. So I thought I'd just go through uh, what this security researcher was able to do. Uh, so this is the title of the post, uh, Bypassing uh, GitHub's OAuth Flow. Uh, and what this uh, person was able to do uh, was basically they can make a GitHub application, um, which uh, is able to read a user's GitHub data. And typically, there's a, there's a prompt that says, do you, wanna, you, know, do you agree to, to give this application access to your data? Uh, and the, the user is supposed to, s supposed to click this button uh, saying that they know what, uh, what the permissions are that this application wants uh, and to give their consent. Uh, he was able to find a way to, uh, without any user interaction at all, to send a request to GitHub uh, with the user's cookies attached uh, that granted his application uh, any permissions he wanted on the user's GitHub account. So just by visiting this attacker's site, uh, your entire GitHub account is just completely owned. And the attacker can access all of the data, all of the private repositories, all of the company secrets, everything. Um, and uh, this is the highest bounty that GitHub's ever paid out to anybody. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty bad, uh, really bad. It also affected all of the uh, enterprise GitHub deployments, which are used you know, by, by companies internally for, for super secret code. The cool thing is, uh, we know pretty much from the stuff we've learned in this class so far, any one of you could have found this bug. Like it's, it's really, there's just a couple of extra things I'm going to explain for you to get the whole picture. But um, this is the kind of stuff that you could do if you wanted to. Uh, some people do just spend full time looking for bugs and, and, and make a living from just finding bugs. Um, that's actually how this person found this bug was uh, he decided, he was curious, could I make a living uh, just looking for bugs? And so he decided to spend, uh, I think it was either a week or a month uh, just looking for bugs in GitHub. Uh, and this was the result of that. Um, so, you know, um, 
and it was his first, his first time trying to do such a thing. So, so it's pretty cool. Uh, I think, I think um, yeah, I think it's an inspiring story. Cool, so let's, uh, before we go into how it works, uh, let's recall uh, cross-site request forgery. So hopefully everyone remembers this. Uh, so cross-site request forgery, the idea is this is an attack where uh, an attacker can force a user to execute actions against a web app that they happen to be currently authenticated with or logged into. So the way the attacker does this is, uh, well, the authentication mechanism that the browser uses is cookies. And cookies have this what we call ambient authority model. Uh, who remembers ambient authority? Somebody want to remind us? What's ambient authority again? Come on, this is sad. <laughs> OK, all right, that's fine. <laughs> Do you want to give it a shot? Yeah, it's go for it. Referring to like, if a cookie is attached to a request based on the domain and port changes? Yeah. It's a fancy word for basically, once you have this authority that you've gained by logging in and proving yourself to the site that you're logging into, uh, all future requests to that site automatically have that authority that you proved once at the beginning by logging in. So all future requests have that same authority as that user. And that's because the cookies are attached automatically to those requests by the browser. This is the same thing we've been talking about all quarter, just a fancy phrase for it. Um, OK, so what does this mean? This means that if, if attacker.com is able to cause an HTTP request, to get sent to victim.com, then the browser automatically attaches the victim.com cookies uh, to this request. Right, so uh, I don't think I ever showed a picture, a pictorial version of how this attack works, so I, I went ahead and whipped one of those up just to review. So uh, we have the client and the server. This is the, the, the victim server here. And the way CSRF works is the user uh, visits the site and decides to log in. So a login request is sent. You can see there the, there's a username and a password in that request. Uh, and then the server checks whether the username and password is valid. Let's assume that it is. And so the server will send back a response. Uh, and this response contains a set cookie header that sets a cookie, uh, session ID equals 1234, and tells the user you, log in, you logged in successfully. Now some time passes. Uh, the browser is holding on to this cookie. Uh, and so maybe a day goes by, or maybe the user opens another tab while they're, uh, while they're still logged into the site, or, or, or something like this. Uh, and now they happen to get sent a link to an attacker's website. So they go to that site. They make a request to the attacker's site. Some HTML gets sent back. And inside this HTML is whatever JavaScript the attacker wants to include. And so uh, once that page loads, that page is going to send a request not to, back to the attacker's server, but to the victim server. Uh, and this request is going to be to uh, some sensitive endpoint, like, say, to transfer money. Um, and uh, they're going to include the parameters that they happen to know that this endpoint is expecting. So uh, $100, and let's send it to Mallory. Uh, and the browser helpfully attaches the cookie header uh, to that. Uh, and then um, the server, as far as the server is concerned, it looks like this came from, um, from a legitimate form, because all it can see is this request, and it, everything checks out in that request. So hopefully this is review. And any questions about this? This is sort of standard CSRF. OK, cool. OK, so recall, the way we fix this is same site cookies. So same site cookies allow you to say, I only want uh, my cookies to be attached when the request is initiated by my own site. Uh, so if a request is coming from victim.com to victim.com, then the browser will include the cookie header. But if the request is coming from attacker.com to victim.com, then the browser doesn't include the cookie header. So you'll see the same site comes up all the time. It's a really great uh, cookie feature. OK, so now let's talk about a new thing we haven't talked about before. And I actually wasn't planning to discuss this at all in this class. Uh, but I'm going to mention it here because it's, it's a requirement to understand the attack that, um, that this, uh, this attacker found in, in GitHub. So, uh, so the reason why I wasn't going to bring it up is because CSRF tokens are actually kind of uh, unnecessary these days. Uh, they are a way to uh, effectively get the behavior that we get from same site cookies, but, the, but before same site cookies were a thing, before browsers actually supported this whole concept. So one thing we might ask is, what, if, what, what did websites used to do before the same site cookie attribute existed? Because for, for a long time, for, for probably mo the majority of the web's existence, because same-site cookie is actually a really new feature, um, for the majority of the web's existence, there was no way to say that you wanted your cookie to be same-site. So that mean, what does that mean? That means that 
basically, it was possible for most of the web's existence that attacker.com could send a get or a post request to your site, victim.com, and your, your cookies would be attached. So w the browser allowed this, and sites had no way to opt out of this behavior. And yet, we need some way to prevent any, any random site from, from being able to submit forms to our server with cookies attached. So what did sites do? Any ideas? Anyone? If you already know what a CSRF token is, or, OK. <laughs> yeah, I know you know. <laughs> um, anyone have any ideas of, of how, uh, how we could detect, how, how we could differentiate wh whether a request is coming from, uh, from our site or from, from um, an attacker's site? Yeah? Uh, look at so you could look at the referrer header, uh, which will give you some idea. That's right. Uh, not perfect for some of the reasons we talked about in that in that lecture about referrers, where sort of there's some ways that the attacker can kind of disable the referrer header, but it is it is something. Um, but yeah, there's really there's really no good way, no no built-in mechanism in the browser um, or in any web standards to enable a site to say they wanted their their cookies to behave in the same site way until that spec was created, until browsers implemented it, and so. Um, so the answer to how we, how we, how we solve this problem is that site, every single site had to implement this thing called CSRF tokens. Um, so let's talk about how that works. Um, so basically, a CSRF token is a nonce. Uh, and remember, a nonce is just some secret, unpredictable value generated by the server and transmitted to the client. And the way we use the CRF token is that the client must include the CSRF token in all subsequent HTTP requests that they make to the server. Uh, in order for the server to recognize that as a valid request. So if you send a request to the server and you don't include the CSRF token, the server is going to say, um, this is an invalid request. Uh, if the token is missing or if it's wrong, it's going to be an invalid request. So it's basically some, 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 the, the server is going to give some value to the client and say, all your requests that you send in the future must include that value or I'm going to reject them. Okay? So far, so good? Okay, so... Uh, this is how you typically include a token. So you, you, you would include an input element in your page, uh, and there's a type hidden, which is kind of cool. So you can include a hidden form element in a form. Um, and let's give it the name CSRF token and give it the value of the, of the actual token. And so because this is an, an input field, when our form is submitted, all the inputs get sent to the server as part of the form. Uh, and this is going to get included as one of the, of the form fields. It's as if the user had typed this into a form field, but of course they, they don't have to do that because it's going to be included automatically for them. Uh, and so how does the server actually generate these tokens? So um, there's two approaches you might use. One is you can just sort of randomly pick, up a, pick a, a value, a nonce, uh, and um, so you know, pick it randomly, turn it into a string, and then let's use that as the value. Uh, or you could generate it based off of some information in the request itself, like the session ID. Um, OK, so now we have this token. The question is, um, how do we use it? What does it actually give us? How does it actually protect us against uh, CSRF? So let's look at how, how CSRF token works. Um, this, this should hopefully make it clearer. So we have a client. They show up to our server. And uh, this is similar to before. So they're going to send a login request with a username and a password. The server checks that it's valid. Let's assume it's valid. So the server sends back, uh, this is very similar to before, it sends back um, a set cookie header giving the user a session. Um, and it tells them that the login was successful. But you'll notice it also included here an extra bit of HTML, um, which is the CSRF token that it chose for the user. In this case, we chose a really insecure one, ABC, but um, I need to save space on my slides. So, so, um, so now th this page includes this token. And so what's going to happen is if the client interacts in any way with the page that was sent back, uh, let's say it submits another form now to do a bank transfer, right? This token is going to be included in that request, right? So, um, so sometime later, the client decides to actually submit a transfer. And so uh, you'll see here that the browser attached the, attached the cookie like usual. Uh, and now we have the, the same form uh, fields as before. So we have $100 going to Bob. Um, uh, but now there's a CSRF token field included, um, which is the, it's basically the client echoing back the same token that it was given uh, at the beginning. Now the server checks that and says, is that the same as the one I gave you before? If it is, then it's going to say this is a valid request and send back a page saying the transfer was successful. Right? 
So, so far, so good, right? OK, so now how does this protect us against an attacker? Um, you can imagine, so this is the same situation as before. Um, we we um, user logs in uh, with a username Alice and a password. Uh, it's valid. We get back the same um, uh, page as before. And now sometime later, they happen to visit an attacker's site. Uh, the attacker sends back some HTML. And uh, when that page loads, uh, that, that attacker page sends a request to the server. Uh, and this request is coming from this attacker. The attacker controlled this. Um, and so the question is, what does the attacker put in here for the CSRF token field? It should be the ABC that it was sent from before. Uh, but because this form submission that's happening here, this post request, is coming from the attacker's JavaScript, the attacker actually has no way to read this input out of uh, the victim.com page. In order to do that, it would need to be able to reach into the DOM of victim.com, which is a violation of the same origin policy. Okay, so basically this server here, the victim.com server, when it looks at this request, um, if it sees that the CSRF token is the same as before, it knows that this request must have come from, um, from the HTML and the JavaScript that it sent down in the original page and not from some other website that the user happens to be on. Right, so even though the cookie is here is valid, right? So th this attacker happened to send this request, right? And the browser attached the cookie. So if the server were just to look at the cookie, it would think that this is actually the user because they are, they are logged in here, but the, the CSRF token is wrong. And so it's going to reject the request, right? Yeah. So usually would, would this be handled um, via or in terms of the session? Because I'm imagining if you did it like per page or per request, like if the user hit the back button, like things could screw up, right? Mm -hmm. So that's right. So if, if the server sees a CSRF token coming, coming back from the client and it has ever given that token out to the user before, it would need to like remember that and treat it as valid. Like I could open up 10 tabs on a site. So I, it's not enough for the server to remember the last token it sent out. It has to like remember all of them, right? Um, and so typically what we actually do is we, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to just generate a random value. So if I go back to that slide where we were showing the code here, this is not a very good approach because it means the server has to basically remember every single uh, CSRF token that it's ever sent to the user for some reasonable amount of time. And a better way is you can just say, look, whatever session ID I gave the user, I already set that in a cookie. The user has that in their browser, right? And so uh, when they send it back to me, if I just can compute what the token should be based off of that, and I combine it with a secret that only the server knows, and use this HMAC function, which is, you can think of it like a hash. It's basically hashing the session ID with uh, some, some secret that the server has. Um, and what's great about this is all the server has to remember is this one secret, and the client is going to provide them a session ID in the request, as well as a token. And uh, as long as the server runs the same function when it's verifying the token as it did when it sent down the token, which is this function here, then um, it should check out. It should, be, it should be exactly the same. And so the server can actually be completely stateless. It doesn't need to remember any of these tokens. And it can still verify that they're correct. Mm -hmm. So does it affect anything whether we use or hear the same token for the whole session? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, um, so so it's true. It's not completely random from from page to page. It's going to be the user is going to be getting the same CSRF token as long as they have this session ID. Um, it's okay though because uh, we're assuming here that um, the user is not going to share this with anybody and the attacker can't guess it, and that's all we care about. Yeah. It's, it's, it's similar, you, you, you know, it is, is a very similar concept. The difference is just where we're using it. So the nonce field that you're talking about is from CSP, okay. and that's where the, um, the server was telling the browser in a header, don't run any scripts unless they contain this nonce as an attribute. And here, it's actually the server that's saying, uh, it, the server is basically saying, I won't accept any form submissions unless they include this value that I previously told to the client. Yeah, but it, it, it's a very similar concept, yeah. Cool, are there any questions about this? This is important to understand the GitHub attack, which is really cool. So yeah, ask questions if you, if you um, missed anything. So, so the reason why, I oh yeah, question, yeah. So if the same site cookie had a preset string enough, then this isn't necessary, right? 
That's correct, yeah. Um, so if the same site cookie header was sent, then, then this attacker request right here that the attacker sent wouldn't even include the cookies. Yeah. And so this wouldn't do anything, yeah. So you could use both together if you're like, one, one, actually one use case for still using this is if, you're, if you have users that are on really old browsers, like maybe you're building an enterprise app or something like that, um, and you care about this. Uh, the other place where you might see this is if you're using a web framework like uh, Ruby on Rails or um, I guess, I don't think Express builds it in, but it's a, it's a popular package that people include. Uh, because like I said, until recently, there was no way to protect against this. So literally every site out there on the internet had to implement this, this protection at their, in their own app code, basically. Although the framework might give you some affordances for you to make it easier. But um, yeah, the browser didn't help you at all here. Uh, so if, you, if you're looking at code like at a company or at an internship or when you get a job after, after college, you very well might see CSRF tokens still because it's just probably in a lot of code bases still. Yeah? So was CSRF just active? Or like was same site cookie introduced just to kind of like standardize things across browsers? So CSRF tokens are, are perfectly effective. Yeah, they completely, like this, basically as long as you're choosing this token from a, a big enough uh, range and you're choosing it completely randomly, then it's impossible for the attacker to guess it, right? Um, they can't like send like a you know 20 billion requests with all possible tokens. It's not it's not feasible. Um, so this is a very very effective defense. Um, same site cookies are just introduced as as a way of saying wait a minute, why do we have to have all this logic for the server to generate this this nonce and then check it and and everybody's doing it separately and oh and if you forget to do it on one endpoint then your app, whole app is vulnerable. Why don't we just say add one attribute to the cookie when we set it and just say same site, and we're done. You know, like it's just a much simpler solution, much less error prone. Yeah. So if the, the, the victim.com server we're defending against is by using a really crappy like check refer header solution, um, the attacker.com server could be like just bypass that super easily by setting like refer equals victim.com, right? Uh, I don't think that the um, attacker can control the refer header to that degree, but they can, they can omit it. They can cause it to be omitted. Mm -hmm. And then the server would have to decide what to do. Is it omitted for malicious reasons, or did it did it get omitted for because the browser is trying to be more private? Like, it's unclear what the server should do. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. So so now we understand uh, CSRF tokens. Great. So now let's talk about the attack. So um, I think I think we we have everything we need uh, for now to explain it. Okay, so, uh, so this is the prompt that a user sees when they're being asked if they would like to give an app permission to access their GitHub account. And if they decide they wanna give the permission, then they can click this authorize button here. Um, and for this demo, he only chose to get like a very minimal set of permissions, but this could have contained like a lot more prompts potentially for, for more, more access. Okay, so what is the flow like when you're actually authorizing um, an application? So say that uh, some third-party app wants access to your GitHub account for some legitimate purpose. The way it works is it's going to redirect you to this URL here, github.com slash login slash OAuth slash authorize. And it's going to include some information in the query string saying what app is owned by that developer. So you're going to get a prompt for that app saying this app wants, your, um, wants access to your account. Um, and so you, when, you, when you go there, you're going to get this authorization page. That's the page we saw before. It's this page. Okay, so... If the user chooses to grant access to the app, then they click the big green button, Authorize, on the page. And then the user gets redirected back to the third-party application. And GitHub, when it does that redirect back, it includes a query, something in the query string, which is uh, basically a GitHub token that the application can use to then access your data by sending requests to GitHub, like out of band, right? So this token is basically like the password to your account, effectively, for, for this app, right? Okay. So that's the flow. So how is the authorize button implemented? So it turns out that you just did it as a form. So the entire button is just an HTML form with one button in it. When you click the button, you submit the form. And uh, that form also happens to contain a hidden form field with a CSRF token inside of it. OK, so this, this, this again, this ensures that a random attacker can't just uh, effectively click the button for you, click the authorize button for you by, by sending a post request to this URL. So when the res server receives these posts, it's going to validate that the CSRF token is correct. And then if it is, it's going to assume that the user must have clicked this button by visiting the page directly. And this request could not have come from some attacker site. That's what the CSRF token gives us. 
One interesting detail is the form actually submits to the exact same URL that the um, page is loaded from. Does that make sense? So you, the app redirected the user to this URL and that loaded this sort of form with the big green button on it. And then when you click the big green button, that also sends a request to the same URL. The only difference is that the first request was a GET request, and the form submission is, is a POST request. Um, so the server can look at the HTTP method and then just do different things depending on what the method is. So that's an interesting detail to keep in mind. OK, so this is the full flow. So we go to uh, an app, example.com, that we want to um, authenticate with or log in, with, log in to GitHub with. And it's going to send us back a page with a login with GitHub button. And say the user clicks the button, the button goes to this URL here, login, OAuth, authorize, uh, and that request goes to GitHub. There might also be, like I said, some query parameters here that specify exactly what app we are trying to give access to our account, but I, just, I didn't have room in the slides. Um, and you'll notice here the cookie is attached, right? Because this is a GET request, the browser navigated there, um, so of course the cookies are going to get attached, right? OK, so we're logged into GitHub. So GitHub's now going to be like, ah, OK, hi for us. Uh, would you like to authorize this app? So it sends back that page. And that page includes the CSRF token. So if, say the user clicks Authorize. Now we're going to post. The form is going to get submitted via a post request to that same URL. Cookies attached, CSRF tokens attached. Right? And so the server GitHub can check, is the token valid? Oh, look, it is. OK, great. So uh, we will uh, send back a successful response to the user. And we'll redirect them with this 302, which is a HTTP redirect. We'll redirect them back to example.com, the app. And we'll include a GitHub token, XYZ, that the app can use to access this user's account now. And so um, then the user gets, their browser gets redirected uh, to, the, to, the, um, you know, to the same page, but now with this little parameter attached. And that's the whole flow. So that's how you log into GitHub. This is actually how you log into most apps. Like if you ever see login with Twitter, login with, it's something like this, basically, right? This is an effective idea. So th this, this token is sort of the key to your account that the app can use. OK, so this seems fine, right? Like where's the problem? Where's the bug? Seems like there's no problems here, as long as we're actually checking the token. OK, so. Let's see what actually what they did. So, so this, attack, this um, security researcher was able to uh, get a copy of the GitHub um, source code by uh, doing an enterprise trial. So he like pretended he was a company, downloaded their source code, um, and then it's very it's sort of obfuscated. But found, he found some code online which um, unobfuscated it to quite a degree. So he's able to sort of just like look at the Ruby code that they wrote, and um, he found this section in there. And so this is the section that implements that uh, authorization flow. So let's see what it's doing. So it says, we have this URL here, login OAuth authorize. And uh, any time a request comes in to that URL, and it's a get or it's a post, then we want it to go to this controller. And you can think of controllers similar to um, handlers in Express. So it's just the function that's going to run um, to handle this request. Uh, and, so, uh, and so all gets and all posts to that URL are going to get handled by this uh, function here. Um, and so this particular function happened to have an if-else uh, check where we checked if the request is a GET request, then we're going to serve them back to HTML with the big green button on it. And if it's a POST request, uh, then we're going to check the CSRF token. Uh, and um, if it's all valid, then we're going to gr grant them permission to use, uh, to use the application. Again, so far so good. I don't see any problems with this. Does anyone see any problems with this? No problems, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think any of this is, is bad so far. OK, one more thing I need to uh, talk about, and then you'll, you'll see what the problem is. So, so there's this thing called an HTTP head request. Uh, so a head request is basically like a, a GET request. The semantics are, if you send a head request to the server, the server is supposed to treat it like a GET request. It's supposed to go and get whatever resource uh, you asked to get. And then uh, before it sends back the response to you, it just omits the body. It sends all the headers, and it just doesn't send you the actual page that you asked for. So why is this useful? You'll typically see head requests used if, um, like your browser, before it downloads a file, maybe it wants to see, is this a huge file? What's the size of this file? So it could send a head request, and then it'll get back at the headers and not the file. And it'll look at the, the content length header and be like, oh, this is a gigabyte file. OK, that, maybe that changes my strategy for how I'm going to download this or something. right? 
So that's a, that's a common thing, but it is relatively niche and relatively obscure. Most people aren't um, using head requests on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and so because of that, Ruby on Rails, which is the framework that uh, GitHub used, um, it knows that most people aren't gonna bother to implement a head request. And so it's like, well, we can just do that for you. Basically, we know what to do when, when there's a head request. We basically just wanna run the code that we were gonna do for get requests, and then um, when uh, that code is ready to send back the response, we'll just tweak the response. We'll just get rid of the body for them and send back just the headers, right? And so the framework is basically like, oh, we can help you out with that. It's so similar to get, so why not, why not just handle it for the developer, right? Most developers would forget to do head otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the reason why we can do this for head is because uh, a get request isn't supposed to change anything. It's not gonna make any, it's not gonna be um, uh, modifying the database, it's not gonna be uh, destructive in any way. Um, you can repeat uh, a get request as many times as you want and nothing is gonna happen. So, uh, so it's no big deal to send, a, to send a head request. Whereas, yeah, you could not do that with a post or with any other um, method. Cool, any questions about head? Okay, so that's how, that's how that request works. Cool, so, uh, so, so Ruby on Rails, like I mentioned, it automatically is gonna handle he head requests for us. So it does that by routing any head request that comes in to the same place as it, as it uh, would route get requests. Uh, and, and Express actually does this too, so it's not just a Ruby on Rails thing. And so it, it's gonna run the same controller code that um, it, would hand, it would run for get requests. And then it's just gonna uh, go ahead and delete the response body when it sends back the response. And so this is a time-saving feature for developers. It's usually the right behavior. It's uh, very handy that the framework does this for you. There's one problem with it, which is that it's a slightly leaky abstraction. Um, a leaky abstraction is just an abstraction that doesn't perfectly hide the complexity from the developer. So most of the time, the developer doesn't have to know this exists, except for in this one case here, where uh, in the controller, which is, again, the handler, the function that's running, um, they happen to check request.get question mark, which is, um, that's a Ruby way of basically saying, uh, this is a Boolean. Anything with a question mark on the end of it is a Boolean in Ruby. It's like, you're ask, it's sort of like is get, basically. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so uh, that re actually returns false for head requests. Um, this is kind of unexpected because the developer said that they wanted this controller to only run for get requests and post requests. And so they may have made an assumption that I'm only gonna ever get a get request or a post request. Uh, and so if they have an if statement in their code, like, like this code happened to, and it's checking this, um, then um, there, in this case, there's gonna be a third value. There's gonna be head requests coming through that same code path. And so let's see what goes wrong when we do that. And so look at the code again. Again, the developer said, I only want get requests and post requests to go to this function. And um, so they thought, oh, okay, so this is gonna handle the gets, and then the else is gonna handle the posts, right? but the head requests ended up in here as well, right? Does everybody see that? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Because this has been two routes, one get, one post, and the whole if else has been a necessary piece of that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is only possible because they decided to sort of handle get and post in one controller function, basically. That's a really good point, yeah. This wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so one important point is, so you might think, okay, so what's the big deal? So they're gonna, somebody makes a head request to the server. Uh, okay, so we end up in this case. There's still gonna be a, there's still not gonna be a valid CSRF token, right? Because remember, the else case, this is the, the case where we're about to authorize an app. So this is definitely gonna check uh, that the CSRF token was included. So an attacker still can't find out what the token is because it can't, it can't violate the same origin policy and go and read that input with the token in it, right? So, so how does this actually turn into an attack? So what happens is the CSRF token handling wasn't actually done directly in this else case. A common thing that frameworks will do for you, and in Ruby on Rails is, um, is a prototypical example of this because it sort of tries to handle as much as possible for the developer. What it does is it says, okay, we know that the user wants to validate CSRF tokens anytime there's a post request coming through. So what it does is basically before any of this controller code even runs, there's another function that runs in Rails that says, is this a post request? If so, check the CSRF token. If it's invalid, return an error page before this code would even run, right? 
And that's how you get CSRF token checking in Rails. And so the problem was when a head request comes in, that's not going to trigger that CSRF token checking code, right? It's a head request, not a post request. So that's, that, that gets bypassed. Then we end up in the controller here, and then head doesn't match this if case, so it runs this code. And then at this point, we're not checking the CSRF token. We've assumed that's already happened, that Rails took care of that for us. And so literally, you can omit the CSRF token, and, um, and GitHub's going to say, oh, that looks legit to me, and uh, authorize the application. So yeah, any, basically, you just send a head request with, to the app you want, and then that user just automatically g accepts that app on their account. One request. Very, very, very elegant. <laughs> yeah, so let's see what that looks like in action. So this is, is now fixed. This was two weeks ago. GitHub actually uh, responded to the Hacker One report. Remember Hacker One? That was what uh, Miles talked about last time. That's where you report bugs. They responded in eight minutes and acknowledged it. And they were like, yeah, okay, yep, yep, we confirmed it. It was very easy for them to test it. They just like sent a head request, oh, crap. <laughs> and then they acknowledged it right away, and then they had it fixed out in three hours. Like it was a very, very severe issue, so they were they were on it right away. But props to them for being so fast. But yeah, so this is fixed uh, as of as of like two weeks ago. Um, but this is how uh, how the attack would have worked. So you visit the attacker server. Uh, again, remember this is really easy to do. You just click a link, right? You end up on you end up on an attacker's page. You get back some HTML, and um, that HTML causes a request to go to GitHub. It's a head request to authorize, and then there's an app ID attached here uh, to, the, to the URL. Uh, and your cookies are sent, and there's no CSRF token in sight, and the server just does, doesn't, doesn't bother checking. It just sends you back, uh, you're authorized. Uh, and then, of course, that's going to redirect you to the, oh, I guess I, I messed this up. This should say attacker.com. So uh, it, it redirects you to, to the attacker.com server with the GitHub token, just like that. <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy. Uh huh. So would an automated fuzzer or vulnerability scanner like, ever try sending like head requests as being as like the behavior is different? Interesting. Yeah, I mean it should. Um, I, I, I'm not too familiar with with the kinds of uh, stuff that people are using in, like in production in the real world on their on their applications. Like, because all kinds of there's like hundreds or thousands of security vendors. I'm sure some vendor claims that they can do this. I don't know um, how effective it is. I would I would guess the hard part about that is like it would need to. You'd only catch this if you were actually sending it with a valid cookie. So the the, the fuzzer would have to be smart enough to to um, to like figure out how to send like a mostly legit request. If it could, yeah, it would catch this. Yeah. yeah did you have a question, Anna? Um, yeah, it was. Uh, so it sounds like there's two problems: one that would be the missing link, and then the other that there's no way for it to check for you. Um, so I guess would it just be missing link? So Express is very much um, modular. So it doesn't actually do any CSRF checking out of the box. But um, there's like a common set of like five or 10 packages that everybody who's using Express pretty much also installs. And one of them is called CSRF, which is, I don't know, some weird pun on CSRF. And, um, and so that, um, that package would, uh, if you used it in this way, it would, you would configure it usually to only check against post requests. So you'd have the same problem, yeah. Um, if you were purely relying on like, you know, uh, on that check on post requests. Now, uh, uh, we'll get to it in a sec. But there's other way. There's actually um, other reasons why this is, would be less likely to happen in Express. I'll mention. I'll try to mention it at the end of um, the next slide. So let's think about um, how GitHub could have prevented this. Um, does anyone have some some ideas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a super easy way to do it. Yeah, that's like a great way to code defensively. Basically, don't assume that you know that the, the two options are get and post. Just be like, I'm paranoid. I don't know what's going to get called here. Uh, else, uh, else if request post. And then I would actually suggest also throwing in an else uh, at the end. Just in I don't know if there's actually code after this this section here, but you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want to just skip both of these. Uh, Cases and then just run like other code afterwards uh, in the in the head case. So I would actually say I would say do this if it's a get, do this this if it's a post, uh, throw an exception if it's anything else. Um, this is this is um, a very sort of common um, paradigm you'll see if you're coding defensively. You'll basically want to say I expect this to be the case. If it is not and 
that would be really bad for some reason. Like if, if, th if this is not, the, not what I assume to be the case, then um, you want to just sort of bail out as soon as you can. You want to just abort, crash the process. Uh, uh, because the nice thing is if you crash here, sure, that means now that so, you know, some attacker has now figured out if they send a head request to your server, they can cause it to crash, right? Um, that's still much better than the bug that GitHub ended up with by not doing this. And the nice thing about crashes is typically in production, right, you have like hundreds or thousands of instances of your app running. And if an attacker can crash one of them or many of them, uh, sure, they affect the availability of your site in some way. But you're going to get an email or some kind of an alert right away saying there was an exception in production. And you're going to look at it and you're going to say, this case was never supposed to run ever. And it just did. OK. One of our, like, my assumptions were violated in a very serious way, and you'll immediately sort of debug it and be like, oh, head requests can come to this code. And you immediately then, you know, figure out the problem and fix the root cause. Um, so uh, asserting uh, that your assumptions are true is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Could you just use, like, instead of request.get, like, not your crash token dot check? Mm, like, check to see if it actually got validated? Well, like, if there's not a good CSS token, then it was a get request to check it because it wasn't a valid. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if, it, if Rails is going to expose that in enough detail to you because it is being handled at like another level. But yeah, if it did, you could do that. Yeah. Any other ideas? There's, other, there's many other ways we could have. Uh, let me go back to the code, actually. Any other ideas? Uh huh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like those lines have to go before that one. Mm. Especially because it's such a sensitive thing. This is like your entire GitHub account. Yeah, yeah there's something to, to that. I mean, you're basically suggesting being explicit and less magical. Yeah. And uh, I'm a fan of this as well. Um, in general, I mean, so it's, a tra it's always a trade off. Like, if you, if you require the user to be explicit and they forget in one place, right, or, or you, you have a new developer on your team who just joined and they don't know, like, they're, they're just learning Rails for the first time, they've been coding in something else, they're going to, you know, you're more likely to make a mistake maybe. Um, on the other hand, relying on magical behavior that you don't fully understand can bite you as this case has demonstrated. So it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I wouldn't have tried to be so clever and be like, oh, I'm going to, I mean, the nice thing about what you su you're suggesting is um, y what you're suggesting doesn't even require them to require to use two different URLs. They could still do this thing where they're, they're using the same URL for both, but they, they could tell Rails that they want a different controller for get and a, than for post. So they have two different functions, one for get, one for post. Um, and, uh, and that would have, uh, that would have solved the problem. Yeah. So one of the nice things about Express, I'll mention it now since this is actually re totally relevant, but with Express you usually say app.get, app.post. You register your um, method up front and you can only pick one. You can't do this like, oh, get and post and whatever. You can't mix the two. Um, the exception is there's this thing called app.use in Express. And with that, you're basically saying, I want all HTTP methods to come to this function and get handled by this function, uh, at which point you now, like all bets are off, you have to basically handle every method. So in Express, you either handle every method or you handle one method. Um, and even though, it's so, even though it is automatically sending head requests to the get handler, um, there's uh, nothing that can go wrong in that case because there's no post code in that same path, if that makes sense. OK, let's keep going. Oh, did anybody have any other ideas for how GitHub could have prevented it before we move on? OK, so yeah, we talked about most of these. Oh, yeah, and then obviously the most obvious one of all that no one said is we could just have used same site cookies instead of CSRF tokens, and then we wouldn't have had to deal with any of this complexity. Um, uh, but yeah, so using a separate controller would have worked. Using separate URLs for the authorization page and the form submission endpoint would have prevented this issue. Um, changing else to else if request post to be very explicit and ensure that head or any other unexpected methods would, wouldn't be treated as post would have worked. Uh, yeah, uh, th those are the things I came up with. Um, so yeah, this is how you would do the explicit check. You just, we already kind of mentioned this, but I would, I would recommend throwing an exception if it's, if it's not a get or a post and just crash the app. It's a catastrophic case. You're not, you're not, um, you don't want to try and, um, uh, 
uh, recover from this. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't the, uh, the insight take the approach that just breaks like the whole thing all together? Because like if the third party app is trying to like, the third party app needs to send the cookies to like GitHub, right? Ah, that's a good question. So uh, yes, let's look at that. Let's look at the legit case. Okay, so this is the legit case. So you're saying that basically your concern is, uh, let's see, at the point where the user clicks the login button and this request goes to GitHub, your concern is that the cookie wouldn't be attached if it was a same site cookie, right? Do you remember same site has two modes? There was strict and lax. Yeah, so if you were using the strict mode, then you're correct that uh, because this request was, so strict basically says, I don't care what kind of request it is. Um, if the user ends up on my site and they came from anywhere, um, don't include the cookies. That's like extreme paranoia mode, right? Um, uh, the lax mode says if it's a, if it, the entire browser is getting navigated to the page, like the top level page is, is changing, which is what's happening here. The user clicks the login button and the whole browser just goes to GitHub, right? Uh, lax says it's okay to attach the cookie in that case. Um, uh, and that actually means that this would work still, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be why if, um, like if you're logging in with OAuth, like Google or Twitter will throw like a permission prompt and say like you have to click authorize to, to, to uh, do that. Uh, but don't they always throw up a permission prompt? Maybe I don't understand the question. Oh, I'm just, um, I think usually even if the app like requires no permissions, they'll still oh. kind of, like, redirect you to their own page and have you like click it there. So I figured maybe that would uh, work around the same site. Oh yeah, there is no way to grant permission at all without uh, the going to a going to a top level Google page. Yeah, you're right because the cookie wouldn't be included. Yeah, I think you might be right. Okay, so let's go back to where were we? We were here. Yeah. Okay, so now let's think about ways that Rails could have prevented this. So we talked about how GitHub, what GitHub could have done. What could the framework have done? What could they design differently to prevent this kind of an issue? I feel like they kind of laid a trap for their for their <laughs> users in a way. Um, any ideas? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So, so if you did a token check for head requests, that means that that would mean that that no one could send a head request to a URL unless they had first loaded a different URL and gotten a token out of that response, right? Yeah. So you could require that of your of your users, but it is changing the semantics a little bit. So, it's like normally I could say I could send a head request to get the homepage of the site. And I don't have to know anything about the site. I can just say, give me the home page. Um, and if you, ch if you required a CSRF token in that case, then I would first have to like do a get request for the home page, get the response, find the token, include it, and then send the head, which defeats the whole point of sending the head. I see. Right? Yeah. But it could work. It's just a diff completely different like, set of assumptions you're making. Yeah. Oh. Get question mark instead what you can have is you have a field being why are you doing this and you have to like insert like a minimum 50 pair <laughs> Yeah. So you can you think that you think checking get directly is is such an uncommon thing that we should just discourage it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, actually don't know how common it is. I mean in from my experience writing code in Node and in Express, I do sometimes check the method uh, like for legit reasons, so I would be maybe a little bit annoyed if I had to always be like writing in all caps or something to like do it. Um, but it would certainly, it would have prevented this case. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you. Yeah, did you have, do you have another one? Uh, no, I guess I was just thinking about like, wouldn't this eventually pop up just as like, like a core three flight header or something? Like if like doesn't the browser send out head requests if they think it might have to visit? The browser, the browser can send head requests for like its own reasons, like for before downloading a file, or another site can just cause a head request to get sent. It's similar to get, so it can just cause it. To, did I, did that, that, yeah, I'm not sure your question. I guess it's because it's a very specific route. I was just wondering how like a no head request ended up just sort of like transmitting there because it's used for other things, just kind of like like three flight header and so on. Oh. But I guess that wouldn't be before the post that you actually do when you click it, right? Like when you do the new request. 
Yeah, <laughs> maybe after we can talk after class about it. I'm not understanding the question. Okay, it's, uh, I, we, we'll talk about it after class, yeah. Um, okay, so I had some ideas for ways Rails could prevent this. Um, so, I mean, one thing you can imagine is just don't handle this automatically for the user. Force them to handle head requests themselves. That's one option. I think that if you do this, then probably no one is going to be supporting head requests in um, their sites, so you kind of lose, lose that benefit. But that's an option. Um, another idea is you could set request.get to true even if it's a head request. Uh, and this is lying to the developer, basically. The framework could lie to the developer and tell them it's a get, it's a get request even though it's a head request. Um, and I, I would argue this is actually fine in a way because the developer, when they wrote this controller, said, I am prepared to handle gets and posts in this controller. So we should assume their code is only going to be checking for gets and posts. So sending them head is kind of a violation of, of the abstraction that we've created here. It's like uh, leaking out some random implementation details that we don't want to leak out. So if it instead pretended that the head was a get, then the, now the, we know the developer's code is going to run correctly because we're only giving it gets and posts like, we, like they asked for, right? Uh, and then after we sort of get the response, we could then delete the body and handle it for them. And now the abstraction isn't leaky, right? It's just, does, do people know what I mean when I say leaky abstraction? Who's heard that term before? Who doesn't, who doesn't know? I can explain. Okay, so the idea of, uh, the reason why we make abstractions is because we're trying to hide some complexity away from, uh, from the developer. So we're trying to simplify the amount of state they have to have in their head in order to uh, program something. Um, it's so like, like the less sort of complexity that they need to keep in mind, the more likely they are to write correct code. And so ideally, abstractions, they uh, eliminate unnecessary complexity, and they only expose the very essential uh, complexity that you, that, like you can, you, can, you can hide too much. You can be like, you know, you can have uh, a class which, or a library which just is, has one function. It's like, do the thing, right? And then, well, that doesn't let you configure anything. How, what if I want to do the thing differently? Like, there's no options to it. So, so you want to expose some complexity, but you don't want to, don't want to, um, to um, expose any sort of extra complexity that doesn't is irrelevant for the developer to solve the problem that they're trying to solve. And so a leaky abstraction is one where it like mostly works, it mostly hides the unnecessary stuff away, but then in some places, like bits of the implementation or bits of uh, details that the developer ideally wouldn't need to, need to know about leak out in, um, in small ways and then violate the like break the abstraction make it less make it a less useful abstraction because now the developer has to keep these edge cases in their head in order to use it correctly like that's what happened here like this abstraction was like oh it's just you know we're going to oh we're going to do this clever thing that the developer won't need to think about and then whoops actually they need to know about it they need to know about head requests so you didn't actually make their life simpler in fact you you just cost them 25k and potentially a lot of you know user data lost so yeah uh, that's that's a leaky abstraction Okay, so another idea, right, okay, so yeah, so basically, yeah, I already mentioned this. Um, and then here's a crazy idea, you could use a more strongly typed language like Haskell or something. So part of the reason why, I mean, you could argue part of the reason why this issue happened is because there was no way to enforce that every case that could possibly get uh, given to this developer's code, there was no way to enforce that they handled each of those cases. In a more strongly typed language, you could actually have a compiler error if they only said case get, case post, and they forgot one of the cases that you might call their code with. Um, this slows down like development arguably a lot, uh, and you know people don't like it. Um, people uh, pe people usually use these these looser languages for a reason, but um, that is one solution. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, I see, like, like look at the function and see if it's in, I mean, in Ruby, I guess you could, you might have some kind of introspection. I know in JavaScript, you can literally two-string the function, <laughs> and then you have a string version of the function, and then you could parse it yourself with your own JavaScript parser and see if it actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, accesses request.head or, or something like that. Uh, I don't recommend that. Uh, there may be... Yeah, I mean, other than that gross approach, I can't think of a way to sort of in advance know that it's going to handle it. Um, yeah. Okay, so so uh, some lessons that I think we've, based on the different uh, possible solutions that we've proposed, I think there's some lessons we can sort of glean um, for how to how to sort of prevent th these kinds of problems in our code or in our libraries that we write. Um, one big common theme that you'll see all the time in security 
contexts is that we want to try to reduce complexity. Complexity is the source of, of so many security issues. Um, and when we have abstractions, the, we're trying to hide complexity from the developer. And, uh, and, and so, um, yeah, I guess I already said this. The more edge cases that an abstraction has, the leakier that it is. So um, the more complexity you have, you also have the more sort of interactions between different components in a system. And it's sort of, you get like this multiplicative effect where like, um, if you introduce a new component, you might think, oh, I'm just adding one thing to this system, right? But if the question is not how many things that I add to the system. The question is how many things did the thing I just add, uh, how many things can that interact with in the system? If the system has uh, 500 other components and I added this one in a way that it could potentially interact with any of the 500, right? Then I've actually, it's, it's, not, it's, it's a much uh, sort of scarier change than, than something that I just added in a very isolated way. And I know it's only talking to this one other thing. Um, so complexity can come from like lots of, of places and it's, it's usually um, the enemy of security. Uh, also, explicit code is better than clever code. So, uh, I think this is the kind of thing that you get, you get better at over time in your career. At least that's how it's been for me. Where, um, like at first, it's really fun and exciting to like try to like write like a really clever one-liner and like, oh, look at all the functionality I packed into this line. Like, I'm such a good coder. I'm going to impress all my coworkers and, and my classmates. Like, uh, because they're going to look at it and they're not even going to know what it's doing. Aren't <laughs> I so? I'm so cool, right? Uh, uh, I'm, I must be more you know elite than everybody else. <laughs> Um, and as you go through your career and then you come back to code and you're like, this is terrible, who wrote this? And then you look at the Git history and you realize you wrote it and you were too clever so that literally your, yourself can't understand it like a month later. Then you sort of, after this bites you enough times, you just start saying like, okay, no, 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 no. I'm just gonna unroll this code and make it much more verbose and much more like dumb, you know, just much simpler. It's gonna do this, then this, then this, and it's gonna look uglier, but it's gonna be understandable. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, just the thing that uh, I, th I think most people tend t to write less clever code as, as their career goes on. That's what I've noticed. Um, yeah, and then the other, another idea is to fail early. So um, if an assumption that you have is, uh, I guess this is, um, I'm mixing the two up. Fail early, the idea is basically if, if something is in a state that you don't uh, expect it to be in, then just, uh, crash or throw an exception. Don't try to like uh, go onward. Uh, d don't, don't try to, uh, to handle it. Um, and uh, you know, like one example where this comes up is you can, you can, you can do this thing in Node.js where you can say, uh, when an uncaught exception happens in my program, I want this function to run, to handle it. And so what, what you can do is you can sort of say, oh, I, I handle, it's sort of like a top level uh, try catch. You're like, any exception anywhere, just go, like, if it's not handled at a lower level, I want it to run this function. And what people used to do is they would just log out the error and then uh, not crash the process. They would just keep it running, right? An idea is like, oh, well, you know, like, it's probably fine. Like, maybe that, w that was an exception that wasn't a big deal. Like, it was, let me just log it, I'll fix it later, keep the process running. The problem is you don't know where the error happened. You don't know what, like, multi-step process you were in the middle of and you threw an exception in the middle of it, and now some state that you set up and were expecting to get cleaned up later, you didn't, you're not going to get around to doing that now because you, you, you bailed out halfway through. Um, so rather than try to resume, or sorry, rather than um, assuming it's fine to, to keep going, you should just crash the whole process because you don't know what state it's in now. Um, and so uh, crash the process, and then usually you have some other process on the system that will just reboot the node process or whatever server process and uh, start it from scratch, and you can... Uh, you have more than one of these, you can handle uh, handle crashes without any downtime for your users. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good idea. And then lastly, code defensively. So assume your assumptions are gonna be violated and um, verify them up front. And, and um, uh, don't assume that your, your function is gonna be called with the correct arguments, for example, right? It might not be. So any questions about these lessons? Do they make sense to people? If you, dis you can disagree if you want. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not like hard and fast rules. It's a lot of it is taste and just like trade-offs. Everything is trade-offs, but um, these are some things that I think are useful. Mm -hmm. If you write clever code, then the upside is that the attacker is not going to understand it either. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we call that security through obscurity though, and we don't encourage it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, 
so I'll skip this. I was just gonna, I was just gonna go through the sort of the, the things we talked about and try to associate them with each of the lessons, but I think that's not necessary. Um, okay, so yeah, the next thing I wanted to, oh yeah, question. Mm. Yeah, so th th so that's a really good question. Uh, so I guess, yeah, what I said before is, is not complete. So if the error that happened is expected, like you say, here's an example. Uh, I'm going to make a query to the database for a particular user with a certain ID number, right? Um, and then I may get a user back, I may not, because maybe that ID doesn't exist. As a developer, I'm actually expecting that this may fail sometimes because say that the ID number that I'm looking up is provided by the user. The user goes to some URL, you know, slash users slash 25. That could be, you know, the user could type in a type, make a typo and go to a, a URL where that user ID doesn't exist. So if I'm writing code to go get that user out of the database and, um, and the, the ID I'm looking up is provided by the user, well, that user might not exist. So I should, in my code, expect that that may return an error to me and say there's no user with that ID. In that, in that case, because I was expecting that error, it's totally fine for, for me to uh, return, like, return an error code to the user, give them a 404 error, and say no one with that ID exists, and to keep the server running. I shouldn't crash, you shouldn't crash the server in that case, because that was an error you were expecting, and you wrote code to handle it, right? And, and um, the difference between that and what I was talking about before is if uh, an exception happens and you didn't expect it to happen, uh, it's not appropriate to, uh, to just like log that out and then keep going. Because it could, anything could have gone wrong. You don't know what, y you, weren't, you actually did no code to sort of clean up and handle that exception. You weren't expecting it, right? Does, does, that, does the distinction make, make some sense? Okay, cool. Cool, okay, so yeah, so let's talk about um, uh, the next topic, uh, which is bad API design. So this is a fun one. Uh, so the idea with this is just that there's, there's uh, so we, you know, we, we mentioned all these different ways that we could, we could try to write uh, better code, uh, clean code, and avoid you know, tricking ourselves and, and being defensive and all this stuff. Um, but sometimes an API that you're using is just badly designed, and it's set up in a way that is likely to uh, mislead you, right? Some ways this can happen is, uh, say that the default uh, parameters that the function um, that you're calling assumes are insecure. And the only way to use this function securely is to actually pass in a bunch of options to make it work the way you want. I would argue this is like, uh, this is bad because most users, if, you know, they're, they're gonna just call it without any options and then they're gonna be running it in an unsafe way. And so we want the defaults to be secure. We want the defaults to be reasonable. Um, so this is one, one way that an API can be, can be uh, poorly designed. You'll notice that it's possible to use it correctly. You might actually pass all the correct options, but you're just encouraging, you're making the easy path the, the unsafe way. Um, another thing you might see is polymorphic function signatures. So this is where a function takes in um, multiple uh, uh, different types of parameters. And effectively, this one function is doing like one or two or three or four different things. And it, 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 the way that it decides which, which one of those things to do is based on the type of the parameter. Like maybe if you pass in a number, it does one thing. If you pass in a string, it does something else. Or if you pass in an extra argument, it does a completely different thing, right? Um, you don't want to bundle too much functionality into one function, I, argue, I would argue, because um, uh, it's, it's harder for the user to use correctly, and especially in a loosely typed language like JavaScript. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about some examples. Um, and this is a really, really wild one. I've seen this before. Actually, Express does this. Um, you can actually have functions where they do a different thing based on the number of arguments in the callback function. Uh, I'll show an example of it. It's called functionarity. Um, okay, so here's a really common example. You, if you've ever used jQuery, um, this is, uh, jQuery is kind of old these days. It's not cool anymore, but um, it's actually still really, really widely used, uh, though. It's still growing, I think, too. Um, but, Anyway, it has, it, it's, a, it's a very good example of a very polymorphic function. So depending on what you pass in, the type of what you pass in, it does a completely different thing. So if you pass in a string that is, happens to be a CSS selector to select an element on the page, like in this case, button, then this will return you, um, the, it will return you a jQuery object that wraps that DOM node that matches that, right? Actually, it could be, oh, it could also return you an array of like multiple uh, nodes if there's multiple buttons on the page. Um, you can also pass in an HTML element, and then it will wrap it with the sort of jQuery wrapper 
Um, you can pass in another jQuery object and then it clones it. So that's, that does a copy operation. Um, or you can pass in uh, some HTML and then it will parse the HTML and create a DOM node with that HTML inside it. You'll notice here, this is a really wild one because this is actually a string and that's also up there a string. So we're actually doing two different things even though it's exactly the same function prototype. We're actually deciding whether it looks like HTML to us or not and doing a different thing. That's pretty wild. Um, uh, also happens to be really insecure in practice. Uh, and then the other the last case is you can pass in a function and then what this does is this actually runs this function when the whole page is finished loading. So they've packed all this behavior into this like one dollar sign function. Uh, and it's, it's handy for prototyping stuff. I mean, it's really fast. It's like the one letter to type, it's a dollar sign, you know? It's like convenient. But um, it's doing like five different things depending on what you pass it. So this is what I'm talking about when I say polymorphic functions. So, uh, oh yeah, here's the, here's the express case I was talking about. So this is really wild. So, um, so this is a middleware. A middleware is, I, I guess I haven't explained this yet in the course, but basically uh, we've been using app.get and app.post and then having these functions that run to sort of handle a get or a post to a particular URL. Um, there's this thing called a middleware, which is sort of a more generalized version of that, where what we're saying here is just call this function for every single request, get, post, head, all of them, all the methods, and all the URLs. Just always call this function. And this is actually where you would do your CSRF token validation as an example, right? You would check if it's a post and then do your validation or whatever. Um, uh, and um, what's really useful about this too is you can call next if you don't want to actually handle the request here. So typically what, what, what the way these middlewares are used is you'll, you'll um, do some logging, you'll do some useful operation, and then you'll call next, and then eventually your, your uh, different handler will get run, like get or a post for a different URL path. Am I confusing people? Basically, this is just a way to run a function before every request. It's a really useful way to do that. But if you pass in a fourth argument to the function, then this is a completely different thing. It then becomes an error handling middleware. And what this does is if an exception is thrown in any of your handlers for any URL that you handle, then Express looks for the first time you called app.use with a four argument function and calls that. Uh, and then that's supposed to handle the error, right? So basically, the reason why this is bad is, like in this case, look, I sent back a response to the user and I didn't even use the error object, right? So maybe, maybe a developer who's going through the code base will look at this function and be like, wait a minute, uh, next isn't used, error isn't used. Uh, maybe I'll just delete these, these arguments because they're not used, right? So you delete them and then now you've changed this from an error handling middleware to a normal middleware. So literally the unused argument is, is important here to get Express to treat this as an error handling middleware. So that's just, that's just a overly fancy API design. It's bad. They should have just made it explicit. Uh, I opened an issue about it and they want to fix it, but it's, uh, they haven't done it. It's been like years, so it's, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, um, okay, how much time do we have? Ooh, we might have to get to this next time, uh, but I'll start it, we have 10 minutes. Okay, so this one's really cool. So uh, this is something I uh, worked on. So uh, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I'm personally invested in it, I guess. Um, so, so there's this thing called the buffer class in Node.js and the idea is, it, is a server often needs to allocate memory. Um, all programs need to allocate memory for various purposes. And uh, at the time, JavaScript didn't have a way to do this natively. Uh, there was no, there, all you had was strings, basically. You couldn't make uh, an arrays, but you couldn't make like a, a, you can say, give me a megabyte of memory and I want to put whatever I want in that, in that megabyte of memory, right? And so Node introduced buffer. Um, later, the JavaScript language itself eventually got native support for this, and they introduced these other things called typed arrays and array buffers, which give you the same, uh, same functionality. And so the browser has these, and then eventually Node also got these because it's part of the JavaScript language now. So Node is now has this redundant, it has two ways of doing binary data now, unfortunately. Um, but that's just the way it is. So this is how you use buffer. So there's a couple ways you can use it. One is you can pass in an array of, of bytes, of byte values, and then you get a buffer containing like one, two, and three uh, bytes. So this is three bytes of memory, right? With, with three, uh, those are the three bytes. You can also pass it a string and then it will uh, parse this, uh, the, it'll look at the ASCII values and then it will fill the buffer with the ASCII uh, values of, for each of those letters. Um, you can give it a number and then it will make a buffer that's 10 long, 10 bytes long. 
Uh, and you can also give it another buffer and it'll copy the buffer. So this is looking a little bit like the jQuery API, right? It's a little bit of many, many different things you can pass into the buffer uh, constructor and you get different behavior. So this should be triggering some alarm bells, maybe. Uh, did you have a question? Okay, so, uh, okay, maybe we can end on the demo because I have, I have a demo and we have nine minutes, so I think we'll have time. So I want to show just how it can go wrong, I guess. Uh, so here we have, ignore that first bit. So here we have a server and what we're going to do is some live coding. Okay, so, so we just imported Express, we created an Express app, and we're listening on uh, port 4000. By the way, speaking, speaking of APIs which are not safe by default, uh, you know the listen API that actually causes us to listen on port 4000? If you don't pass in an IP address as the second argument to it, then you're listening for uh, any connections to your computer on port 4000. So what that means is like your laptop, if I didn't include this, any of your laptops in this room right now, if you knew my, my computer's IP address, which you could probably find because it's just on the Stanford network, you could, you could connect to my server, right? Um, so really what, what, what this is doing is it's saying uh, basically only let browsers on my same machine that connect to port 4000 actually connect. Don't listen for connections from the outside world, basically. Um, that's, an un that's very unsafe, <laughs> that it, the fact that that's not the default, uh, especially because I'm trying to code insecure servers right now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, anyway, okay, so let's, let's see what we can do here. So I'm gonna make uh, an API endpoint that just takes a string and then converts it to um, a hex encoding or a base64 encoding. We'll let the user specify what they want. But basically, we'll take in some ASCII text and we'll convert it to hex or base64. So let's make an endpoint called uh, slash API slash convert. And uh, this is the function that we'll run. And so let me make a comment. So this is the way I want to use this. I want the user to visit slash API slash convert. And I want them to pass in a data query. So it'll look like that. Slash, uh, slash uh, question mark data equals and then I want them to pass in a JSON object. So it'll be like, JSON will be like a stir, um, hello, and then type hex. So th if they visit this URL, then we're gonna basically parse this, figure out that they want us to convert the string hello to hex, okay? Okay, so, so let's do that. So basically the main thing we need to do here is to get the data off of the request query object. So that gives us, the, that gives us this string right here. Uh, great, and then now we wanna actually parse it as JSON, because right now it's just a string, and I wanna turn it into a JSON object. So I'll call json.parse, and now, now this data variable is literally an object that's gonna have two keys, stir and type, perfect. Okay, so, and then just to be safe here, I will, I will just confirm that this actually worked. So yeah, by the way, if this string is not valid JSON, then this JSON parse function is gonna throw an exception, and that's okay. Express will actually just um, deliver an error to the user in that situation. So I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna try catch, I'm not gonna put a try catch around it, I'm just gonna let it fail if it, if it fails and the user will see an error message. So, great, so, so now, if we get to this point, we actually have an object. So what I wanna do is, let's see here, I'll say if, they didn't provide me a string, then I'm gonna give them an error. Um, so I'm gonna throw an error missing data.stir. Uh, also, I only want the type to be hex or base64, let's see here. Oh, sorry, so if it's not hex, if it's not hex and it's not base64, and it's not, uh, oops, oh, I'm doing this wrong, sorry, like this. Okay, and it's not uh, UTF-8, which is just a plain, a plain uh, like a, a normal string. Um, then I'm gonna throw a new error. Uh, Data.type is invalid. Okay, so now if we get here, I have a, an object with these two things, and I think that they're, I think they're in the right state, so I'm gonna actually go ahead and send the user a response, and I'm gonna convert the string uh, to the type. 
and I'm going to send this back to them. And uh, convert is not a real function, so I need to implement convert. So convert is going to take a string and a type, and it's going to convert that string to the given type. And this is very easy to implement. What I do is I return a new buffer. So new, new buffer will take st the string, turn it into a buffer, and then buffer has, an, has a two-string method that takes a type. OK, so all I'm doing is I'm taking a string the user has given me, I'm turning it into a buffer, like raw bytes, and then I'm converting it into the string form that I want. OK, and so then uh, that's what I sent back to them. Does this code make sense to everybody? Any obvious security issues? OK. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. OK, cool. OK, so let's see if this worked. So I'll go to localhost 4000 slash. Uh, I guess I already have an example here. So I don't know if everyone can see this, but basically I'm just going to slash API slash convert. And then my data query uh, uh, value is just uh, stir is hello and the type is hex. So let's see if this gives me back a hex, hex value of hello. I don't know if that's correct. It looks correct to me. Let's just go with it. Um, let's try base64. If that looks right to me. Let's try changing this to a longer string. OK, it looks like it's working. What happens if I don't give it valid JSON? So let's say I add like an extra, some extra braces here, so it's not valid JSON. Cool, it, it handled the error. The server didn't crash, right? The server, the server just printed a warning, but it didn't crash. OK, whatever. Uh, so this looks good. OK, so what is the problem? What if I told you that changing this parameter here from a string to a number would be disastrous? Like, absolutely catastrophic. Uh, OK, I will change this to the number 100. And it's not in quotes. You'll notice the 100 is not in quotes. It's actually a number. When I do that, I uh, guess what I'm getting back. This is raw server memory. So I, like any, what this is doing is, if you're familiar with malloc in C, this is calling malloc, and it's not zeroing out the memory. So what, what this means is it's giving me memory that was potentially used for other things by this process earlier in time. And so this could, could potentially include sensitive user data, like uh, you know, the user's password, or anything that was ever in memory in the process at any point in the past. Um, so it's pretty wild. And if I, um, if I actually, uh, let's see, let me, um, let me refresh this a few times. Actually, let me, let me change this to UTF-8. So UTF-8 is, um, is basically uh, normal human readable like Unicode uh, text. Uh, and so if I do that, most of the, the bytes you're going to look at are not valid. Like they just, they're just garbage memory. But occasionally, you'll get a string of like user data or some string that looks like it, you know, this, was, this was in the mem in memory of the process at some point in time. So if I refresh this a few times, um, let's see. So far, nothing that interesting. Uh, quo, was it? Oh, increase the size? Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's make it bigger. Yeah, sure. Uh, OK, so this is looks, I mean, OK, this is interesting. There's an, an Arabic characters, but there's, uh, there's also like code and some, something that was in memory at one point in time. Uh, yeah, so if I kept doing the, oh, whoa, what is this? This is, this is a code from Express, it looks like. Yeah, OK, so see, basically there was some memory at some point in time that contained code, and then it got freed, and then we malloced it, and it wasn't zeroed out. So this is, this is a bad API design. <laughs> basically, this code looked totally benign, right? Uh, and it turns out we were, we're running a server which completely just will just print out any, any user data that was ever in memory at any point in time. This is, by the way, very similar to Heartbleed. Have you ever heard about the Heartbleed attack? It was an attack where you could send a request to a server and it would just print out random memory. And eventually, if you did it enough times, you would get the, the secret key that is used for the TLS uh, handshake. So you'd literally have the server's secret key and you can man in the middle all the users of that service. So uh, anyway, uh, we don't have time to actually go into exactly uh, uh, how this works, but we'll talk about it next time. Um, and I'll see you all on Thursday. Thanks.